Good morning. Good morning, Chakra. Good morning, Puneet. You all know that banks are under-regulated industry, right? I'm kidding. In 2008, it became even lighter. I'm kidding even more. Uh, banking and uh, financial service industry is highly regulated industry, as we know. As Bo talked about the exponential technologies and its impact on the business, positive impact on the business, but there is always a concern. Does it pose higher risk? Can we pass the regulatory checks? In a way, it's sort of a BFSI stress times as far as regulatory pressures and the risks are concerned. Let's hear from Chakra and Puneet in a fireside chat. And what a beautiful name for this program, a cool Bangalore morning, right? To have a fireside chat with two eminent guests, Chakra and uh, Puneet. I'll begin with my first question. Even before we get to the exponential technologies, Puneet, I would like you to comment first on uh, what are the regulatory and the risk challenges that you face in uh, corporate banking and retail banking? And then maybe Chakra, after Puneet finishes, you can talk about securities and investment banking challenges. Puneet, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mohan. Um, delighted to be here today. Um, first, I do want to just make a comment uh, on the topic itself, which we're talking about, that it, it sort of gives an impression as if the BFSI industry is stuck in a gridlock because of regulators and, and uh, you know, challenges in that space, which, which is not necessarily true. Um, I think uh, the regulators are actually an integral part of the ecosystem, which help us do well what we anyway want to do, which is we want to be safe, secure, effective, efficient, and serve our customer needs. Now, having said that, um, Mohan, I'm going to talk briefly just about the retail bank and the commercial bank areas only. Um, I know Chakra is, is way better informed to talk about the areas of securities and investment banking, so I'm going to let him do that. You know, the regulatory environment really varies from the systemic when, when uh, the regulators want to look at our uh, balance sheet, they want to look at liquidity, they want to look at capital ratios. And at the other end of the spectrum, if you go down to the retail customer level, a regulator also wants to make sure that actually the access to credit is fair and even, that the services which are being provided like mobile banking, internet banking, ATMs, et cetera, the provisioning is absolutely, you know, the availability and provisioning is there and everything in between uh, is really covered in a regulatory sense. But I want to just, just very briefly touch upon one or two things, you know. There are, the regulators do help in consistency, much as GDPR, as the, uh, the regulation for data privacy and protection across the European re region and becoming somewhat of a standard in the rest of the world was rolled out, it actually ensured that there was a consistency across the whole region in terms of what we try and work for. On the other hand, in UK, we have an example where the regulators came out with an open banking standard, which said all banks have to make sure that their services are available to others through APIs in a standard format. And that made sure that even the fintechs could now stand up and offer a set of services which traditionally they would not have been able to. So I look at regulatory as being the, the sort of guiding light, the auditor who holds us in place, but also helping us move forward. Mohan, back to you. Yeah, that's great, Puneet. And I remember the quote from my chief auditor in my previous company used to say, the regulators and audit functions are like a brake in a car. It doesn't, uh, it does, it's not there to stop your car. It's there to give you a confidence to drive fast. So well said, right. Puneet. Uh, Chakra, why don't you take it over and uh, talk about securities, investment banking, or any other issue that you think uh, as, as you are concerned before you even get to the exponential technologies, Chakra. Chakra, you're on mute. Uh, you're done mute. Thank you, Mohan. And uh, Puneet, good to see you again. It's great to be on a panel with you. So yes, as Puneet said, I think uh, regulators uh, are an important part of the overall industry. And uh, we do view regulation as something uh, you know that we, we need. And also, 
they kind of uh, help us in doing things that we want to do anyway, right? I think that's a great opening. So in terms of, uh, you know, since 2008, as you were saying, Mohan, uh, the regulatory landscape has become more involved in the industry and especially for companies like ours, which were uh, not bank holding companies, since we became that, there's more and more that we need to do on the regulatory front. And there are lots of, uh, you know, a lot has changed in terms of what we do in the last, uh, you know, 12 years or so. And there's more that's being done to make sure banks have all the capital, um, you know, capital and liquidity requirements that, that, and that the industry and the overall ecosystem is still, right? It's all about stability of, of, uh, of you know, making sure that overall all the economies are stable and everything functions well. You know, mostly lately, I think the big things that are happening in the industry, in securities, uh, in the security spaces, uh, definitely, you know, GDPR is one uh, from, uh, you know, from UK, about cust- consumer data protection is become very important. That's one, you know, uh, you know, for the overall, how we do our capital calculations, you know, FRTB, Basel IV, that's a big, big uh, regulation on which there's a lot of work happening across the industry. And also, uh, LIBOR rates are being replaced by, by you know, uh, newer reference rates, which is called ARR programs, alternative reference rates with uh, so, you know, SOFR in, um, in uh, US and with SOFIA in, uh, in UK. And uh, there's a big change to how we do, uh, you know, UMR phase five, unclear, unclear margin, how it's been done. You know, uh, that, that's how that we go. Most of these were things that started from 2008 and that are slowly, the, you know, we are becoming better and better at making sure all the controls are properly there across the industry. Just to touch a bit on what's happening lately, you know, the big thing is we're all in a video conference now, and uh, that's because of COVID. And lots of things have changed due to COVID for all of us. And suddenly, a lot of people working from um, home brings up its own challenges. And uh, we are all very, very uh, trying to figure out how to work effectively. But at the same time, uh, all the even the regulators are looking to make sure that we have, um, you know, good security for the overall firm when a lot of people are dispersed and working from the individual spaces. So the work from, you know, a lot of times, you know, when you're in an office environment, everything is secure and sure there are no data breaches and all kinds of technologies installed on the desktops and throughout the, throughout the uh, network to make sure, you know, all the consumer data, everything is safe. So, but when people are working from home, do they have the right um, you know, software installed to detect any malware that can come through? All those things have issues that we are very concerned to other regulators and also operational stability of overall uh, system. Uh, I mean, including people, I mean, if, um, you know, can we really serve our clients and meet all the SLAs? That's a big concern that's happening. And, uh, you know, all Zoom, you would have seen, we all use Zoom. It's kind of taken off and there were a lot of security concerns about Zoom that come up. And so, we, uh, you know, regulators are watching and trying to make sure that we are doing the right thing. And we are also very concerned and we all invest a lot in making sure uh, that we're complying with that, making sure we're protecting the industry. Right, so those are the things that are broadly happening. If you want me to drill into anything specifically, lovely. Before I go to the question two, there are a number of questions coming from the audience, and I, I'm tempted to ask one question straight away. Uh, maybe Chakra, it's a uh, your your background of information and data breach is a question that so the banks are getting sophisticated in terms of how to protect. The intruders are getting even more sophisticated, right? And uh, what is a financial organization doing to safeguard its data? Uh, that's a question from from. From the audience. Thank you. I think um, I would say at least our firm, and uh, I would think rest of the industry also, other firms also. We we, we heavily invest into cybersecurity. You know, a good portion of IT dollars go into cybersecurity. We know the threats are only going up every year, year over year, and even recent COVID, uh, I think we've seen some escalation of more threats. So there's a heavy investment that goes in. Um, and to making sure there's proper governance and, uh, you know, that not only we have all, so, you know, constructs to prevent uh, anything for anybody from reaching into our, uh, you know, our network, but also we, we very actively monitor anything that's happening you know, in the perimeter and even inside. And we have very good, uh, we have you know, centers where people are always monitoring and we are ready to respond very quickly. Right? Uh, I would think that we have world-class you know, um, cybersecurity team. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that we invest heavily in and we're always focused on, 
right? I think the dialogue internally and probably in the industry has changed in the last maybe 10 years or so, where even developer development teams, when they're architecting systems, start thinking about security, whereas that may not have been the case, you know, a decade uh, you know, in, the, in the past. Um, so uh, I think it's becoming part of the culture to think about security. So yeah, it's it's a uh, upping. You know, as the threats go up, we are also kind of trying to invest more to protect uh, protect the firm. Thanks, Chetra. Uh, so just to sum up, the first round is uh, what I heard is the regulation is there, but it's there for good reason to protect the bank, protect its customers. It sometimes is enabler, as Punit said. The data breaches, uh, uh, DevSecOps, uh, DevSecOps will be able to sort it out through both development through the operation lifecycle. I'll move to the, the meat of the question, right? Uh, with the regulatory challenges already there, which is uh, very glad that you guys said it's, uh, it's uh, an enabler in more ways than one. This AI and cloud, uh, we'll also talk about blockchain, big data, but AI and cloud in specific uh, creates uh, tremendous opportunities and both talked a little bit about that too. Um, but it can introduce new risks. Uh, Puneet, uh, what is your view on uh, this cloud or AI? You can pick one area or both and comment, and then Chakra, you can comment uh, uh, where, where do you see opportunities and where do you see the challenges being introduced? Puneet. So Mohan, without uh, explicitly picking one, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about AI, but you know, AI, the, the foundation is cloud also for a lot of what we do. So there is, the Venn diagrams do overlap actually. Um, and, and I want to step back, you know, when initial days also when system design used to be done for, and I'm talking about within India, I'm talking 20, 25, 30 years ago when we were building systems and we used to talk about some very basic stuff, the 101 of system design, we used to talk about things like non-repudiability of transactions. So once a transaction goes through, you cannot reverse it out. We used to talk about traceability and audit trails that how you can make sure that you can exactly trace where a transaction is and going. So jumping forward to today in the AI area, I think one of the most important things and challenges which I see and, and which has implications from a regulatory perspective also is, what is our operational risk framework as we use AI to automate decision-making in the firm? So many of us would have seen instances of where you go to websites and people say enter these five elements of data and in three seconds we'll give you a decision on whether we've approved a loan or not now what's happening behind it it could be as simple as a decision tree it could be more than that it could be an algorithm more than that it could be an algorithm which is being modified and fed by machine learning through ai it could be you know in that entire spectrum the technology behind it could be in any of those. So the question arises is that when the regulator turn, turns around and asks you saying, why did you take this decision, number one? Can you trace and explain that if you approved, why was it approved? If it was declined, why was it declined? Were those decisions aligned with your stated policy and which is, you know, which faces off to the customer of how you look at them and what you expect them to deliver? Are you applying it consistently across your customers or are you doing it a little, it's not consistent. So that whole area, and I know, you know, I'm not diving too deep into it, Mohan, at this time, but I'm saying that broad area, which could range from credit decisioning, it could range from product offering, it could be about what kind of interest rates you offer to people, what kind of credit lines you give. It could be based upon a, portfolio of products you give to them or not, that to me is the single biggest challenge. And it is not an insurmountable one, but it is a challenge which at the design engineering level of when you're building your systems, you need to make sure. This is not something as a bolt on, which you can just put on and say that, I will take a decision and post facto analyze it and see that that process has to happen. So to me, that is the one single biggest area that we should be able to be transparent about the whole cycle right from the decision taken by our algorithms, how machine learning fed into it, and how it is consistent with what we have stated as our objective and goal. Yeah, Back to you, Mohan. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Very helpful with a real use case. Uh, Chakra, maybe you want to cover a little bit about the cloud?
Chakra, you're on mute. Sorry about that. So, yes, Mohan, I mean, I completely agree with, uh, just before I come into cloud, just to finish uh, the discussion on AI, certainly I completely agree with uh, Puneet that the transparency and explainability of the decisions that are made, I think that's a key challenge. Technology, uh, I think we just started using AI. Uh, we're at the beginning stages, there's still a lot of, lot, lot of ground to cover and there's a lot of potential that can be realized. And it's definitely one of the most exciting, if not the, the most exciting thing that's happening in the industry and across industries, right, in terms of what we can do. And uh, explainability is one key challenge. Also, the data that we use to train the models, that's a very important thing because what you train with is what you get. You know, one of the first principles when I went to college to study computer science is garbage in, garbage out. So AI is all fancy and everything, but if the data with which you train the models is not good enough, then there could be a lot of, uh, you know, the decisions that are made may not be good enough too. And also if the data that you're training with has some inherent bias, whatever the bias may be, the bias will also creep into the model and it will go forward. So, you know, th th that's also a big challenge because we're training, uh, you know, you need to cleanse the data, make sure it's all good and it doesn't have any bias in it, right? That's a, a very interesting problem. Once again, we're at the beginning stage, lots of tools are coming, even for explainability, all the big firms and even startups, they have good solutions that are experimenting with. Uh, and I think uh, it will only get better. We have to see where this goes. Now, in terms of cloud, in addition to AI, the other, of course, big, big thing that's happening across industries is cloud. Um, you know, we're all very excited about it because of the elasticity it provides and of course the costs are reduced. But more importantly, all the new tool sets that are being built to build our own systems, most of them are not becoming on cloud. There'll come a time uh, in a in few years where the tools you want to use won't be available on prem and you only have to go to cloud to get that. A lot of vendors don't want to, you know, give you on-prem solutions. It's easier for them to just give it to the cloud. So we're all going to the cloud. The big concern, of course, for us is uh, data protection. I mean, we are in the business of relationships and uh, uh, protecting client data is very important for our business. Of course, regulators also look at it, but if you have any data leakages, it really, really adversely impact the business. So data protection, making sure data is safe and uh, is a very important thing that we look at as we're going into the cloud. Right? And also the other dimensions that are coming because of regulations, localization of data. Every country, every regulator would want data in their own, uh, in, in their own uh, physical boundaries of the country. So how do we manage that? We are sort of trying to do that within our own data centers, but when you go to cloud, we need to make sure we have control over where the data is placed and how it is protected. And of course, as I said, cybersecurity is other, other, other thing that we're concerned about. All the cloud players have their uh, security um, governance and security processes, but we also need our own uh, things to be able to do within their within their infrastructure that we need to have control over. So we're looking at that too. The very interesting thing that happens in addition to all the security and all of this is also, we have very stringent requirements on how overall data lifecycle management, that is when it comes to data destruction. We need to make sure when data is deleted, it's not leaking out anywhere. And because cloud is a lot of shared infrastructure, we, we have to, and because it's a multi-tenant multi environment and a lot of infrastructure is shared, that's where we get the cost benefits. We need to make sure the data lifecycle is managed well by the CSP when we leverage them. So that's another area that we are very focused on to make sure that uh, everything works as we want. So uh, also there are certain technical things that since you're in a multi-tenant environment, um, the other thing is you are essentially the container technology, it is not, doesn't sandbox everything the way a VM does. So the container technology, there's a chance of data, uh, so, you know, a, a malware or something coming in and being able to access across processes data that it's not supposed to access. So we need to be very careful as to how we leverage the cloud. But also end up, these are challenges, but it's very exciting. It gives us the ability to go into cloud, gives us the ability to process humongous volumes of data that we would otherwise be able to process using technologies like AI, you know, the best of AI solutions that may be there that are at any given point in time and all the other things that come with to manage uh, you know, huge amounts of data. See, one thing that may not be obvious is the quantum of data that we are processing now, I mean, to look at what we processed 10 years ago, probably, you know, it's exp it has grown exponentially. So we need to be able to keep this data somewhere 
and run models on it, AI models or some other models. And need you know humongous amount of compute to process all this data. Everybody is processing exponentially more data than we did even 10 years ago. So cloud uses a lot of data, right? So that, that's why we're really excited. Hey, thanks, Chakra. That's that's terrific. And uh, I'm tempted to the number of questions, but I think we are pushing on time. Uh, Puri, the question is styling made for you against the backdrop of what Chakra said. What is the GDPR risks, especially uh, you are operating in Europe a big uh, time? How are you managing it? And crystal ball gaze it and see that uh, what will be the data production law in India and how are we geared up for that? Uh, a quick rapid fire response from you, Puneet. Um, you know, GDPR. At, at the, from an outside-in perspective, it tends to look fairly onerous, uh, at least in terms of meeting the requirements of it, because it inherently does go, you know, but by itself, if I look at GDPR, I'll tell you the complication is coming when you are taking a nationalistic view and layering it on top of GDPR. And countries are starting to say that we want you to keep our data within the boundaries of our country. And that is where actually the complication is starting to come because then we are, you know, to what Chakra was saying a little while ago, we are not being able to leverage the cloud effectively if I'm going to say that my data has to sit within national boundaries, which means my cloud service providers need to have data centers in every country where this kind of a situation. And very quickly, Mohan, talking about the Indian, uh, you know, the data privacy one, and it's open right now for public comment and it's being discussed and uh, debated. I, I think it has largely taken from the GDPR framework itself, very obviously. But I like the fact that there is this public discussion and debate and input which is happening. And the only thing I want to leave to everyone is that areas, please engage with it. Make sure your organizations are engaging with it and are giving feedback, because I think the intent to go through the feedback and take it seriously is very high. So that would be nice. That's terrific. Uh, thank you very much, Chakra and Puneet. And I will just sum up this uh, in uh, three points, uh, uh, Chakra and Puneet. Number one, you say regulation is good. Uh, sometimes it's an enabler. Number two, AI is a technology which can change the bank. But through responsible and interpretable AI, both Chakra and Puneet said that we can manage the risk. And as far as cloud is concerned, data privacy and data lifecycle, as Chakra said, and Puneet, you talked about GDPR is a risk, but there are enough in the system to manage those risks. So both Puneet and Chakra have stressed the point, there is no BFSI stress. The risk can be managed. As we said, these are the brakes in a car which are there to ensure the car drives faster in the digital transformation era. Thank you very much, Chakra and Puneet again. Thank you, Mohan.